I'm going to talk to you about some research evidence from a research project um, from our capital city um, in Edinburgh in Scotland. And if you haven't been there, it's very beautiful. Here it is. Um, it's about the same size as Atlanta, Georgia, just to give you some idea of the population size. Um, the study I'm going to talk about is the Edinburgh Study of Youth Transitions and Crime, which is a prospective longitudinal study of young people young people's pathways into and out of offending amongst a cohort of just over 4,000 young people um, who started their secondary education at around age 12 in the autumn of 1998. And what we aim to do was study offending within three main contexts. First of all, in terms of the individual's development through their life course and, and various developmental stages. Secondly, in terms of the physical and the social structure of the neighbourhoods within which these children were living. And thirdly, which is the focus of today's paper, to look at the impact of intera interactions with agencies of social control and formal law enforcement. Um, we took a census-based approach, so we tried to get every ch child of the right age into the study, and we managed to get all of the public-funded mainstream schools involved, not so much of the independent schools and the special sector schools, but overall we had 92% coverage. We interviewed these children using a self-completion questionnaire over six annual sweeps between age 12 and 17, and we followed up some of the cohort routinely um, uh, thereafter, including a follow-up at age 25. And there's a website link there, and I can give you further information if you want more information about the... Uh, about the study. Um, I seem to have lost a slide, so I'll tell you what it says. We collected multiple sources of information on these children, uh, which included self-completion questionnaires, but also in-depth interviews with the young people. We also conducted surveys of their teachers, their parents. We collected data from school records, social work records, police records, children's hearing records, um, criminal convictions records, and we, can, we constructed a, a geographic information system about wh where these children lived as well. So we had a vast amount of data on them. Um, now, what I want to focus on today is on some of the quantitative findings from the study about young people's interactions with the police. And this is based on the police practices as they were back then, which actually they've changed substantially now, which I'll come on to talk about at the end. So in six annual surveys between age 12 and 17, young people were asked about various types of adversarial contact that they may have had. And this ranged from the relatively innocuous telling them off or just moving them on within a, an area to being stopped and either questioned or searched to, to more kind of physical interactions where they may be picked up and taken home to their parents or picked up and taken to a police station. Now, all of these would count as adversarial, but none of them would necessarily result in any, any actual formal recording. If, however, a young person had committed a non-serious act that constituted some kind of crime or offence, a juvenile liaison officer may have issued a formal warning to the child. Um, now, that may have been done by letter or it may have been done by face-to-face -face, uh, in front of the parents. But at that time, the, the police were operating a three strikes and you're out policy. So essentially, if a young person had com already committed um, previous offences and had received two previous formal warnings, and then they committed another one, or if the child um, committed a, some sort of more serious offence, they, they would be charged with the crime. So we've got police charging down at the bottom. Now, that wouldn't necessarily be recorded as a, as a conviction, but it would go on to their formal record. When a child under 16 in Scotland is charged by the police, they're generally referred to what's known as the children's reporter. Now, the children's reporter is the official who administers our youth justice system in Scotland. And they would review the case and they would decide whether or not there may be grounds for that child to have compulsory measures of care. So in other words, does the child actually need formal intervention or not? If they decided the answer was yes, they would be brought to a children's hearing where the case would be heard by not criminal justice practitioners, but a lay panel of three members of the public who are trained to make a decision about whether, um, and if so what, intervention is required. So that, in a nutshell, is the youth justice process uh, in Scotland. And what I want to show you now is just from our study, um, the percentage at, at each um, stage of the, each, each of the sweeps of the, the fieldwork, what percentage of them actually had contact, adversarial contact with the police. And you can see from the chart behind me that it kind of, it, if you ignore the 8 to 12 at the beginning, which picks up a lot of things over a, a number of years, the, the following years are all annual. Um, and you can see it kind of peaks around about age 15 and then starts to decline again. And that actually matches in with a picture of serious offending, which I haven't got here, but I'll tell you that was the case. So you can see that you have um, a number of people who um, have adversarial contact. 
far fewer of them within that actually are formally warned. And then within that, um, less than 10% year on year were actually charged by the police. If we look a little deeper at those who were charged, so this is taking this, the, the bottom part of that previous graph, um, you can see that those who are ch of the, those who are charged by the police, a smaller proportion again, less than half year on year, are refer referred to the children's reporter, um, and then less than half again are actually brought to a children's hearing. So in other words, just to summarise, many children have adversarial contact with the police. Most are not charged with a crime. Even when they are, most are not referred to the youth justice system, um, and only a tiny proportion, roughly less than 1% year on year, are formed dealt with by being placed on supervision. So a lot of diversion was already going on within the system. Now what we were interested in was um, what was it that predicted being warned or charged by the police? Why was it that some kids were just dealt with um, in more informally uh, and others were actually dealt with more formally being warned and charged? So we looked at a broad range of measures and we identified that there were four key factors that seemed to predict being uh, receiving a, a formal warning or charge. The first was, not surprisingly, uh, more frequent and serious, uh, frequent involvement in serious offending. Um, the second one, though, was more frequent truancy from school, so there was a kind of link to other forms of behaviour, but also availability for policing. Thirdly, we also found that those who hang us around the streets on a daily basis were also more likely to be warned or charged by the police. But it wasn't for all children. There was an interaction here between socio-economic status. So it was only those kids from, from poor backgrounds, basically, that were more likely to be picked up and were formally warned by the, the police. Those from more middle-class backgrounds who were hanging around on a daily basis didn't tend to be warned or charged. So that was what predicted a first warning or charge, just an initial one. When we looked at what then predicted a subsequent warning or charge, we found that the same four things came out again. But more importantly, what also came out was the fact that these kids had already been previously warned or charged. So in other words, you, um, you, in fact, what we found was that was the, the most a significant factor that the, those young people who'd been previously warned or charged, their odds of being warned or charged again were five times higher and that was the, the main thing that predicted whether they went on to be warned and charged again. So what we were finding was that there was this kind of policing practice that, that recreated a, a group of usual suspects um, who were repeatedly recycled around the system uh, which we found to be to little effect. So to explore this in a little bit more detail, I don't want that, yes I want that one, um, to explore the impact of different stages of system contact, we conducted some quasi-experimental analysis by matching cohort members at age 15 who had and had not had prevention or intervention at each of these three stages, so a police charge, a referral to the reporter and then supervision. Um, importantly, they were matched on a whole range of background characteristics, um, which was uh, particularly important to match them on serious offending behaviour. When we looked at between group analysis, which we've got presented here, you can see that looking at their, matching them at age 15 and then looking at them a year later, there's no difference in terms of the, the percentage of serious offending amongst those who were um, charged by the police and their match group. There's also no significant difference between those who were referred to the reporter and their match group. But the children who proceeded most furthest into the system who were subject to supervision were offending far more uh, frequently than their matched group um, uh, the following year. If we look at differences within the groups, we can see that, um, as I said earlier, there was a kind of general pattern of desistance after age 15 anyway, so there was a reduction uh, within each of the six groups. But we found that those who'd been charged by the police but had no further action, and those who'd been referred to the reporter and had no further action, did as well, if not better, than their matched groups. But those who progressed furthest into the system and were subject to the most extensive repeat charging and referral were less likely to desist from offending than the others on average. Just to give you an idea of their longer term outcomes, um, we found that in terms of predicting what young people made that transition from the youth justice system into the adult criminal justice system, it was systemic factors mainly that came out. Kids that were excluded from school, kids that had early histories of being warned and charged by the police, and importantly, those kids that were identified as being most needy, most vulnerable, most disadvantaged. Their longer term criminal justice outcomes weren't very hot either. Those who were re referred to the reporter by the police on offence grounds were five, five times more likely to be convicted by age 22 and 33 times more likely to be imprisoned by age 22 than other kids. There's a happy ending. 
The findings have been used to underpin the evidence base for the Scottish Government's early and effective intervention programme for under-16s and a whole system approach for youth justice to under-18s. The police now operate a multi-agency approach to working with young people, moving towards maximum use of diversion away from youth justice and focusing particular attention on keeping 16 and 17-year-olds out of the adult criminal justice system. The whole systems approach has been described as an effective way of working with high-risk young people involved in offending, and because it's underpinned by evidence from the study that intensive system contact can have de detrimental consequences on offending behaviour and longer-term life chances. Thank you.